I still didn't get the German script. <laughs> I was like, I'll do that part later. <laughs> but I was like, Lord, thank you for letting me first start. I'm not going to be upset. Just, you know what? It's a blessing. And the with truck, I didn't show up, which was good because then I didn't have to pay anybody. So the Lord just works everything out, even when we think it should be worked out another way. So I just want to thank the Lord that He just comes through every single time. Amen. So. <clears throat> Uh, I had a gentleman get saved today. Um, his name was Douglas. He was a, I don't know how old he was. He was gray hair. So. <laughs> and he had, he had some kids, so he's probably. Either way, uh, it was nice because he, had, he was seemingly uh, actually interested, which uh, most people aren't interested. Had a lot of questions and everything. Um, I guess the blessing at the end I was kind of going to share was. Um, he got. He understood that uh, he was going to hell, and uh, kind of got to the end about how great that you paid him, and it's just by grace that you need to be saved and saved. And he accepted Jesus as a savior. And he's like, so easy. And I said, it is. I, I asked him how hard it was to believe, and I, he said, no. I was like, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you believe your car will start more? And yeah, it's a little hard, but uh, how easy it is to be saved. And um, I'm just, I was thankful that we serve a God that makes salvation that easy. Amen. I can go up to anybody. I don't have to spend three hours explaining to them the Bible. It only takes 10 to 15 minutes because it's so simple. And he was really happy. Um, he didn't cry or anything like that, but you could tell in the mood he was like, really excited and happy. It really changed his mood. Um, I guess that was a blessing. salvation um, my friend Brian actually got saved a few days ago so I mean. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else all right complete everyone please stand and turn to page 264 we can turn to page 264 <laughs>
Thanks, Sharon, for playing that. I requested that some time back. And apparently for people who play musical instruments, which I can't, uh, that song's really hard to play because it's written in a minor key, whatever that means. But it does make a difference, apparently. And uh, so I gave her a copy of that, and I said, could you learn this song and play it for me? And I'm going to reference this song later toward the end of the message. Uh, it's very important, and it's an old, old hymn, hundreds of years old, so uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's real interesting. I'll get to that later, but I want to thank you for playing that. And I want to talk tonight about taking a stand for the Lord. And I'm one of those guys that thinks God is sovereign and controls not just the big things, but the little things. Amen. So I've been working on this sermon outline of taking a stand, and then tonight, shake your blood us and stand up for Jesus. So I said, well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I really like that, how, how God worked that out. And I think he controls the little things like that. You know, he says, the hairs of our head are numbered. And he didn't say, I'm able to count them if I wanted to. He said, they're numbered. So... Uh, our God pays attention not to just the big things, but the details as well. Amen. And I'm going to start in the book of Ephesians, if you want to read along. Ephesians chapter 6. we look at Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to focus, like I said, on uh, standing for the Lord. And there's two kinds of stand. Actually, there's uh, several aspects. Our standing before God is one of absolute perfection because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to our account. And when we stand before him in judgment, there will be no mention of sins of any kind whatsoever. That was judged in Christ on the cross and his righteousness was imputed to us. So our standing before God is one of absolute perfection. However, there's another aspect of taking the stand in our daily deportment, which is to confront evil and, and challenge it. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. So in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll start in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the laws of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto uh, with perseverance and supplication for all saints. So you, you can please be seated. In verse 10, uh, Paul says, By the right, finally, my brethren. So this is, he's coming to the end of this epistle. And he's given them a lot of instructions. And he's discussed various different things. But it gets down to the end, and it's very important. He says, finally... I got to tell you this. This is uh, something you need to know. He said, "Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." Without the armor of God, we'll never withstand the forces of evil. We can't do that ourselves. Our our old human nature in uh, joining with the forces of evil, we'd be defeated right away. But I notice he says, "Put on the whole armor of God." Uh, just putting on part of it won't work. 
we have to have the full armor of God because the enemy will find any weakness, any lack, any anything missing will be exploited by the forces of evil to try to attack us and bring us down. So he says the whole armor of God. And you see, if you look at verse 13, he repeats that. He says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. So we have to be as prepared as possible. And he goes on here, we'll, we'll look at some of these verses about what the armor of God is and what we need. But it's important that we have all of this. It's not a, it's not a deal where you can pick this or that. It's not like the cafeteria where you don't want this, but you take some of that. We need the whole entire armor of God so that we can stand against the devil. Verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to deal with, some of these. Uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world, well, obviously, if they're rulers, they're in a position of authority, and they have underlings that will help them enforce that authority. And it's not just that they're rulers, but they're rulers of the darkness of this world. And there are certainly a lot of them, uh, doesn't matter uh, what brand of politician they are, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, whatever, I don't trust any of them. And I don't see any of them showing any allegiance to our Savior at all. They're, all, they're primarily concerned about power, and increasing their power and tax revenue. Everything else is negotiable, but those things, and they're rulers of the darkness of this world. And a lot of the problems we see on the news every day, if you watch the news, it's all about uh, bombing in Syria or Iran or something, you know, people dying all over the world. And uh, it's not the, the small people like us that cause these problems, it's politicians, it's rulers of the darkness of this world. And it's hard to combat that. And we'll never do it without the uh, full armor of God. And then it says, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's a hard one. Not hard to understand, it's hard to fight. The Pope comes up doing this and carrying his scepter and his big hat. And to the unsafe world, that is the epitome of Christianity. They don't understand, they don't know there's a difference. Because nobody's told them, they don't really understand it. And he is, in the eyes of the world, the ultimate Christian. And when they see him, you know, he claims to be the vicar of Christ on the earth. And then he comes on the news and says, we have to make an allegiance with the Islamists because, you know, Muhammad and Jesus really the same person. That's spiritual wickedness. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for a lot of people to comprehend just how incredibly wicked that is to, to take <coughs> this Bedouin moon god and equate him to Jesus Christ. That's worse than just not believing in Christ. Uh, you know, I mean, that's spiritual wickedness, and that's hard to fight because so many people hold that religion in such high esteem that if you say anything about it, they think you, you've lost your mind or you, know, you had some kind of problem. But it needs to, we need to take a stand against that. And yeah. in verse 10 and, 11, uh, 10 and 11 and 12, he tells us we need to put on a whole armor of God so that we can do this. In verse 13, he says, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and then notice it says, having done all, to stand. There's no point in making all the preparations. And there's no point in taking all the measures you need to take to stand. And then when the time comes, you don't stand. Right. And um, Paul, in one place, used an analogy, of, a sports analogy. Uh, people running in a race. They said they all run in the race, but only one receives a prize. 
course, he's talking about whoever won. Now you get participation trophies. Everybody gets the same trophy where your dental has the first. It doesn't matter. But back then, you had to win to get the trophy. Sure. And uh, can you imagine uh, our grandchildren really love basketball a lot? And it's come down to where they're getting ready to start. The two teams are starting to play the championship. And these teams have practiced and practiced and practiced day after day for months. They played games all year. They come through the playoffs, all that stuff. Now it's down to the championship. Can you imagine if when it's time for the game to start, instead of going out on the floor for player introductions, they just went up in the stands and sat down? and didn't play the game. You say, well, that'd be ridiculous. Well, it's the same thing if we Christians take all these preparations we need to take to take a stand and then don't. Uh, so verse 14, he says, stand therefore. Verse 13, he says, having done all that you need to do to stand, then stand. But he says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And truth is an incredibly important part of this. <coughs> Jesus said in uh, John chapter 17, verse 17, uh, the prayer that was recorded of him just prior to his uh, betrayal by Judas. He was in the garden with his uh, other apostles praying. And he was praying to the Father and he said, uh, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And here it says we, we are have our loins girt about with truth. And the truth is this. And I really thank God that he has preserved his word so that I don't have to take the word of the guy with the big pointy hat and the little scepter and doing the sign. I don't have to get him to tell me what truth is. God gave me truth right here. Amen. And I had this, and this is to me the final authority. And for those guys up there in verse 12, uh, uh, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, uh, spiritual wickedness, it's all about authority. Controlling you, what you do, what you think, what you say, because uh, power is a form of wealth, and that's what they want. And so we're to have our loins girt about with proof, and we're to have on the, plus, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. <coughs> that will affect our conduct and how we act. You know, uh, the breastplate of righteousness would forego angry outbursts. And uh, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, the Bible says. And I'll deal with that also in a little bit. We'll see an example of that in the Bible. Uh, our feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And thank God he's given us his word. We had, I believe he preserved it. He promised he would in the Psalms and other places, and I believe he did. And in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication for all saints. Verse 18 starts out with a very important clue, praying. Part of being prepared, part of being ready to take a stand, involves praying. Uh, because praying doesn't change God. Praying doesn't change the world. Proper praying changes us Amen. so that we're in tune with God's will and that we do those things that's pleasing Him. As he said, if you ask anything in my name, you'll receive it. A lot of people use that verse improperly, uh, but the other verses teach us that if if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. But how do we ask things according to His will? And that's by getting ourselves right, by confessing our sins, praying. And prayer is a very important part of this, along with uh, the breastplate of righteousness and hell and salvation and all those things. So, 
I want you to open your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. I'm going to look at a couple uh, cases here in the Bible where people took a stand. And we'll, we'll note a few things about that. Daniel, chapter 3. <coughs> Starts in verse one. I'm not going to read all these. I'm going to start reading until we get down to ten. But, uh, verse one talks about King Nebuchadnezzar. He set up this gigantic uh, statue. Where right? this thing, I think, was uh, 90 feet tall or something like that. It's huge. And uh, he sent messengers out to all of his king. He had a huge kingdom. He ruled over a lot of land and a lot of people. And he made a decree, and this is a case where there's civil government trying to control divine worship. That's important for us to remember that fits in with part of this is what I'm talking about when we take a stand. We have a civil government here trying to regulate divine worship, and he sets this thing up, and he had his herald, verse 4, a herald, uh, which would be equivalent to a modern day newscaster, I suppose. Uh, he said, What time, this is verse 5, what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbutt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So the head of the government set up this idol and issued a government decree that people worship that. And uh, then they announced, verse 6, the punishment for failing to comply is whoso falls not down and worshipeth, the same uh, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So that was the announcement. This is a requirement. You worship this idol. If you don't, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. And so uh, there were certain Chaldeans, verse 8, came near and accused the Jews. Well, imagine that. <laughs> they accused the Jews, and they told the king, uh, they buttered up the king there in verse 9, and said, O king, live forever, and all that. In verse 10, it says, You made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, satin bump, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the image. And who, uh, verse 11, whoever doesn't do that will be cast in the furnace. In the verse 12, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. Notice this. <coughs> have not regarded thee. So they ought to give him on their side. And so they, they arranged this so that it looks like these men are intentionally insulting the king. That sets the king against them before he even hears anything else. And it says, They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou set up. So they already got him against them before they even announce what the charges are. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought these men before him. Uh, now James chapter 1 verse 20 says, The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Right here we read that Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He was filled with anger. So what he was doing certainly wasn't righteous at all. And when we were reading in Ephesians, one of the things that a Christian is supposed to have to control his behavior is the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness and anger are opposites. So the king is furious. And then look at verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? And I can only imagine, you know, here's a, a man full of fury when he spoke to them. I'm sure it wasn't a pleasant. He would say, Is it true? is probably very harsh. And um, verse 14, he says, is it, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I set up? And then he reminds him, I'm in charge here. Uh, verse 15, 
uh, he gave them a chance to comply. Basically, he's reminding them he's in charge. He had them cast in the fire. And uh, he said, if you'll, you'll worship this image, you, you forsake God. I'll give you another chance. You forsake God and worship me or my image. Everything will be fine. But he, he failed to realize they're not his servants. He's not going to be there on Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. At least he's not going to be on the throne on Judgment Day. And then I like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And every time I read it, I can't help but remember Proverbs 28, verse 1. It says, The righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Now watch how they answer the king. He was, keep in mind, he's furious. He's filled with anger. He's threatening to kill them. He's the head of the civil government. He can tell these soldiers, kill these men, I'll kill them, no questions asked. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. So they were defiant. They were taking a stand. Now we're not even worried about how we answer you here. Uh, and why can they be like that? <clears throat> Verse 17, they said, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. There's shield of faith. Uh, from the burning, fiery furnace. Remember in Ephesians it said, With, with this we quench the fiery darkness of the wicked. It's an interesting how this works out. They're going to throw them in a burning, fiery furnace. And uh, so anyway, it says, the God, uh, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us. There's faith. Out of thy hand, O king. But that's not the end of it. Look what else they said. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image shall set up. They're taking a stand. And it wasn't easy. They're talking to the king. King had power to have him executed. He was head of the secular government. He had all his power. He had soldiers at his command. And he just finished threatening them. If you don't do this, you get thrown in the furnace. And they said, uh, God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, we're still not worshiping your false god. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he basically just totally lost his temper and his composure when they, they were indolent like that. And he spake and commanded they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Get that thing as hot as it could. And he commanded uh, the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast him into the burning fiery furnace. They didn't just get rank and file soldiers, you know, whichever ones happened to be next in line. He gave orders to get the biggest, strongest, best soldiers, the best efforts of the wicked to punish these men. Verse 21, Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Uh, therefore, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace was exceeding hot, and the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, you know, there's, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember which psalm it is, but it talks about the Wicked's foot being taken in the snare he set for the righteous. And these men were trying to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they cast him into fire, but the flames killed them instead. And uh, verse 23 these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake unto his counselors. Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And he answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. 
And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So there's something very interesting here. Actually, several things we need to mention. Number one, they were prepared. They were fused. They were prepared and uh, established with God. Therefore, they took a stand and refused to worship a false god. And they took the stand, but they got cast in the furnace. And the lesson for us is that taking a stand for God, standing up for what's right, doesn't necessarily mean the road's going to smooth out and everything's going to be lovely. And these men didn't know until they were thrown in the fire that the fire wasn't going to hurt them. But they were taking a stand anyway. For all they knew, they would be burned off. But they still didn't compromise. They still took a stand. And they didn't find out until they were cast into the furnace that it's not burning us. So that's something very important. God doesn't always deliver us from, from uh, hard times. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, men will persecute. He said, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you. He says all manner of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake. And he said uh, they would uh, punish Christians, people who follow Christ and believe on him, but suffer persecution. And uh, so he didn't promise to deliver us from the hard times, but I, I think it's just like with these men, he delivered them through the hard times. He didn't spare the hard times, and somebody rightly observed one time that sometimes God calms the storm for his child, and other times God lets the storm rage and it calms his child instead. And I think that's what happened here. But then verse 25, and this is a verse we all need to be familiar with. <coughs> he answered, he being the King Nebuchadnezzar, said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, if you look in your Bible, you see Son of God is capitalized. The people that have the same spirit of these Chaldeans, if you look back in verse 8, wherefore uh, at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews, the evil spirit those people have is the same evil spirit that causes these modern day people to alter this verse so that it doesn't say like the Son of God, it says like a son of the gods. And that's blasphemous. Ooh. And they don't believe the deity of Christ. So every verse that clearly deals with it, they change it. And a son of the gods is exactly what the king was trying to force him to worship. And it's a no. But the people who write these modern versions, they do worship those false gods and false idols. And in their case, it's called scholarship or something, you know, some high and mighty doctor of divinity that doesn't believe. It probably is not even saved, I don't know. But the spirit that causes them to make that change in that verse is not the same spirit that led Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to resist the evil of uh, worshiping this false god. But God delivered them. Uh, verse 26, And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Uh, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the fire and uh, the, the king praised God for delivering his servants. And at that time, he changed and made a decree that everybody had to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Still thinking that secular government controlled divine worship. So he, he learned some truth, but he still didn't, he still didn't get it. But uh, they took a stand, and they were persecuted, but they were delivered. Now, Flip over just a couple pages to Daniel chapter 6. You know, everybody knows this. One of the first things you learn when you're a little kid in vacation Bible school. 
Uh, I don't know, if, I don't remember if there's a little song that goes with it or not, but about Daniel and the lion skin. And it's important for us to remember it's a den of lions, not just a lion skin. Because a lion skin can be empty. But it's a den full of lions, this is, that's a real threat. It's not the same thing. <clears throat> but at any, any rate, here's another case of a secular government trying to, trying to control divine worship, trying to control the worship of God. This time it's a different king. It's not Nebuchadnezzar's Darius. And uh, he has these agitators that come up and they said, uh, uh, you need to make this regulation. And nobody can pray to any God but uh, your God. And, and uh, in verse uh, 1 through 3, it's an account of how Darius had set up Daniel to be the president over one of the provinces in his kingdom. And he preferred Daniel over the rest of them. And uh, verse 4, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel, just like in the other ones, the Chaldeans, uh, that wanted to do something hard to Jews. Here these men, uh, they honed in not just against Jews in general, but against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none of fault, none occasion or fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error found in him. So this is uh, this is the kind of Christian I wish I could be. And the reason I'm not is not anybody's fault but my own. But uh, they couldn't find any any way to accuse this man. He was living a godly life. No, even though he was in a position of power and authority, he was not abusing that. And these men said, this is verse 5, these men said, we should not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they knew, well, you know, that we don't like that. We'll use that as our leverage to get him in trouble. So they all said, verse 6, they all got together, they made a pact, and they come to King Darius and said, live forever. So just like the other guys buttered up Nebuchadnezzar, they come to the king and they're, they're flattering him and all this. And uh, <clears throat> they said, make a firm decree. This is about midway through verse 7. Make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask any petition or shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, will be cast into the den of lions. So they're pretending to exalt him and lift him up, and really what's motivating them is their hatred of Daniel, not any genuine respect they have for the king, but they're using him. So uh, verse 8, Now the king established a decree and sign it, so he did. And I look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he knelt upon his knees uh, three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So we read back in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6 about praying and how that's a very important part of the armor of God. And Daniel apparently did this all the time. If you look at the end of that verse, said he did this as aforetime. So this was his normal routine. This was his daily practice was to pray. And uh, so it's not something he started just when he got in trouble. Many times when it, you know, that, I do a lot more praying when I'm in a hard spot than when everything seems to be going good. But this Daniel, uh, in whom they couldn't find any fault, he was praying all the time and he didn't stop uh, when this government decree came to not worship God. He didn't stop worshiping God because he had prepared himself. And here in verse 10, he's taking the stand by continuing to serve God. And he was serving God openly. Then they came near, uh, verse 12, they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. And they said, king, didn't you make this petition? Not throwing people in the you know, lines. And they said, yes, yes. And, uh, then they, in verse 13, they started tattletaling on Daniel. 
And um, that Daniel, which is all the children of the captivity, uh, children of the captivity of Judah regardeth not thee. Remember in verse uh, in uh, chapter 3 when they came to Nebuchadnezzar they said Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego regardeth thee not. So they're presenting this as though it's a personal insult to the king. They want to get the king angry so he'll uh, conduct himself in a, uh, in a manner that, that would tend to Leave Reese in the logic count. <clears throat> so he said, uh, This man regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree thou sign, but maketh this petition three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was sore displeased with himself. Sort of different from Nebuchadnezzar, who just lost his temper. Uh, uh, so the king was. Uh, he was very displeased with himself. He realized he had been had. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. And he couldn't. You know, a lot of times people try to, sometimes you make a mistake. And you cause a problem. And you try to fix it. And you can't. Because some things you just can't fix. It's broken and broken. And, uh, so these men, they all assembled and they kept stirring the pot, stirring the pot. So finally, verse 16, the, the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. So just like the three Hebrew children that were cast into the furnace, when they took Daniel up and they threw him over the edge down into that den of lions, he didn't know until he got down there where the lions were, they weren't going to eat him. He had faith in God. He trusted God. Whether they did or not, he was going to trust God. And God saved him. But look what uh, Darius said in verse 16. In the verse 16. Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So this guy's a little bit different than Nebuchadnezzar. But He's a dangerous person too. And you have to be very, very careful about Christians. They're all for you. They want you to do well. But they'll work with your enemies. you got to watch out for them. And sometimes they're even more dangerous to us than those who are just openly our enemies. Because we know they're our enemies. But the guys, you know, the Bible warns about flattery. you got to watch out for that. This king, he genuinely wanted to help uh, Daniel, but he had gotten himself in a position where he couldn't do that. And how many times have I got myself in a position where I, I couldn't do what I knew I needed to do? And sometimes you just have to suffer the consequences of it. So they threw him in the dental flies, and they put a stone, verse 17, they put a stone on it so he couldn't escape. And in verse 18, the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting and it didn't even allow him to bring any musical instruments to cheer him up and then verse 19 the king got up very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions and he came to the den he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel and the king spake unto Daniel and said oh Daniel servant of the living God is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions Verse 21, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God had sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they had uh, not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So God spared him. He didn't spare him from being cast into the den of lions. But he spared him from destruction. He preserved him through that persecution. Just like he kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through the fire and delivered them, he delivered, delivered Daniel from the den of lions. Of course, we know the rest of the story. They took uh, the men that accused Daniel and threw them in there, and the lions ate them up before they even hit the ground. So they came back on them. And it's very important for us to understand that when we take a stand for God, well, first of all, we need to be prepared to do that. You 
can't take a stand if you're not prepared. You will be defeated in very short order. And these men were prepared. They took a stand. They suffered the consequences of it. They weren't given a pass and an easy road. But God protected them through their persecution. And God protected them uh, through all this danger and delivered them. And so this is a couple wonderful examples in the Bible of taking a stand. And what I want to do is, uh, there's something I want to mention. You see, you might have noticed I got this, this book. I got this years ago. Uh, it was one of the textbooks we used when we, I was in uh, Bible college, uh, by the way, with Wayne Giles, who was uh, the pastor here. He and I were buddies in college, went to college together. And, and we got these books. He had one. Uh, I don't know if I ever had to it. You might share You might have one in your house somewhere. Uh, the, the title of this book is Imprisoned Preachers and Religious Liberty in Virginia. All right. That's a long title for a book. But, uh, this book goes into a great bit of detail. And sometimes it gets sort of tedious. And it's a little, little bit dry reading. But it's a history book. It has a lot of important things in it. And a lot of people don't understand, back in the colonial days, all the states, or the col they were called colonies then, they all had an official religion. Pennsylvania, you were required by law to be a Quaker. North Carolina, you were required by law to be a Presbyterian. Here in Virginia, you were, were required by law to be an Episcopalian. No matter what you wanted or what you thought, the law required you to be an Episcopalian. And you paid taxes, and part of those taxes supported the Episcopal Church. And the priest, or minister, or whatever he's called at that time, was a government agent. He was an employee of the government. And he was paid with tax money. So you had, you was compelled by law to support this, whether you believe that or not. Uh, they didn't care if you believed their doctrine. You were required to pay to support it. And there's also a law that said you had to be, you was not allowed to absent yourself from the house of worship for more than 30 days unless you wanted to pay a fine. It's all about the money. Uh, pay a fine. And if you kept uh, missing church, you'd be cast in jail for that. So you said, well, what about people that were Episcopalians? Well, you had to go down to the magistrate and apply for a dissenter's license. And then you was allowed to miss church, but you still had to pay your tithes and your taxes to support the church. And all you did, you got a license to miss church. Of course, you had to pay a fee for the license. It's all about the money. And uh, the, But there were... Baptists back then. And they would uh, gather just like we're doing now. And they had a pastor and preach the word. But that was a criminal offense back then because the secular government was trying to regulate divine worship. Just like in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, in the case with Darius, the secular government was trying to control and influence the the people of God and how they worship him and forbid them from worshiping God and demand that they worship an idol or a statue or whatever. And uh, so these men, there's, uh, there's five in particular this book deals with a lot. A man named John Waller, a fellow named James Reed, another named Lewis Craig, and then James Child and William Mash. These five men were Baptist preachers. Back in the time in colonial Virginia, when it was against the law to be a Baptist, you were required by law to be an Episcopalian. So when they would meet and preach, they were violating the law. And uh, so the magistrate came and they arrested them. And they said, this is a deal. You have to post a bond and promise to not preach for a year and a day or you'll go to jail. 
And they all said, we're not posting any bond, and we're not going to quit preaching. So they got put in jail. They took a stand, and they were in jail. And uh, they were in jail in uh, Fredericksburg, and for whatever reason, later on, uh, they had to move, they needed to be moved to spot the jail in Spotsylvania County. <clears throat> and so the, the people come back and they said, look, we'll give you the license to preach as a dissenter. We'll give you a dissenter's license. Uh, just pay the fee, get the license, everything will be fine. They said, no, we're not going to do that because if you have authority to issue the license, you have authority to deny the license. And government officials have no authority over the worship of Almighty God. So you have no authority to issue or deny the license. So we're not going to do that. So they stayed in jail. And they took a stand and they ended up in jail for it. But God preserved them because this one fellow, especially John Waller, they had him in the jail. And he was situated where he was by the little window there. It had the bars in it. And he would preach through the window. And a lot of people, they want to go down and sit, you know, I'm sure word spread. Said, hey, did you hear about that? that dissenter, that Baptist guy got thrown in jail and he's preaching through the window. So people started going down there out of curiosity to see what's going on. And he's preaching the gospel and people started getting saved. And we had Brother Doyle, or Brother Doyle here talking about revivals. And this revival broke out so bad that the people, the sheriff, built a wall in front of the window so you couldn't stand out in the street and see John Waller preaching through the window. So then people started sitting on top of the wall. And they said, okay, okay, we've got to move these guys to Spotsylvania County. And as they passed through the streets of Fredericksburg to the goal of Spotsylvania County, which at that time was located in Fredericksburg, they sang an old hymn. And this is the song that I had Sharon to play that she played just a few minutes ago. She said, you gonna sing it? And I said, no, you know, people had enough trouble in her life already. <laughs> but uh, remember how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king? They said, well, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We're not serving you. God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to uh, worship you or your idol. So these men sang this old hymn. This is the words of that song she played. Broad is the road that leads to death, and thousands walk together there. But wisdom shows a narrow path with here and there the traveler. So these five men were bound together. Their hands were tied, and they, then they were tied to each other. And they were being marched through the streets, and there's crowds on the side throwing things at them and cheering and hissing and all that. And they said, Broad is a road that leads to death, and thousands walk together there. So, to my way of thinking, that was sort of a jab at those, the crowd. You know, there's, just because there's a lot of you doesn't mean you're not on the road to destruction. And the Bible says there's only a remnant that will be saved. And sometimes we hear these uh, wealth and prosperity preachers talking about oh, you know, revival spreading all over the world and everybody's coming to Christ. No, they're not. The Bible says that only a remnant will be saved. In the end, it'll be a large number, but it'll only be a small remnant of the people that ever live. But here they said, broad is the road that leads to death, and thousands walk together there. But wisdom shows an error of path with here and there a trap. And that harkens back to what Jesus said when he was, is in Matthew 5, <clears throat> he said, Broad is the road that leads to destruction. And uh, he said, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. And that's what this song's based on. And it's, to me, it was uh, very interesting to, to, to read this and see this. And verse 2, or second stanza of the song, says, Deny thyself and take the cross is the Redeemer's great command. Nature must count her gold but girls if she would gain the heavenly land. So it goes on, of course, there's more to it, but 
I managed to find the music for this song, and uh, I really appreciate Cher playing that for me. But uh, before I close up, you know, I've been talking about taking a stand. Jacob picked the song, uh, Stand Up for Jesus. And uh, that's something we really need to, to be aware of in the day and time where we're living, is taking a stand for the Lord. Because there's uh, rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, they're as bad now as they've ever been. And we have to be prepared to stand up for, uh, for the Lord. And like these men, we, we might have to suffer the consequences, but if it's God's will that we do that, He'll deliver us just like He delivered them. Because it's, we're serving the same God that Daniel served, the uh, same God that shut the mouth of those hungry lions can protect us just like He did them. So I think it's very important for us to be prepared to stand by having a fresh plate of righteousness, a helmet of salvation, and so forth. And be willing to do that. And when the time comes, we need to stand. I think a lot of problems we have in this country are because Christians didn't stand back when things weren't really so bad and were just starting to get bad. If it had taken a stand back then, maybe it wouldn't be like it is now. We can't go back. It's not a child's game where we can say, do over, do over. Um, what's done is done. But the God we serve is able, just like they said, God we serve is able to deliver us. And He certainly is. And so I just, I hope that's an encouragement to everybody. I don't mean to sound like a dire blue morning and you know, bad times are coming, but they are. But we need to be ready to stand uh, either way. And I hope that's an encouragement to you to know that uh, God that delivered them can deliver us as well. Let's stand, please. Uh, I have a, I have a song.
I keep these words in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for the message we received today, Lord. We pray in the way that it's touched our hearts, Lord, that you would make it stick in our minds too, Lord. As we go and leave here today, that um, the message will come with us and that we can be stronger to stand up for you, Lord, when you need us to. And that, um, 